Good evening from the hallowed halls of Epic Financial Strategies in Red Bank, New Jersey. In the Epic Productions podcast studio, we are Infinity X. I am Dave Hartner. I'm joined by my partner, Eddie Gardner. What's up, Eddie? How are you tonight, brother? Doing great, Dave. Excellent, excellent. And we have the incredible good fortune of of, uh, introducing to our stage and microphone none other than Mr. Chris Gronkowski. Chris, are you there? I'm here. How's it going? Gronk, what's up, buddy? Happy Tuesday. How are you, sir? Man, I'm good. I'm good. It's it's been uh, coming off a really good month, man. And uh, just keeping keeping the rhythm going. Love it. Love it. And, you know, on the Infinity X stage, um, we create infinite sales opportunities by merging ecosystems, edifying human excellence, and giving a stage and microphone to the megapreneurs of megapreneurs. And Chris, you are absolutely no different, brother. We are so honored to have you here this evening. Um, what I always love to do is you can't know where you're going unless you know where you came from. So, Chris, where did it start for you, brother? Where did you grow up? For sure, man. Uh, grew up Buffalo, New York, middle of the five brothers. Uh, man, just, just mayhem, uh, nonstop <laughs> brawls, nonstop fights, just bread competition. And, um, you know, ended up, uh, in the NFL, four of us, one played, uh, minor league baseball as well. And, uh, it was, it was a good run for us. So my next question is what was it like fighting for food at the Gronkowski dinner table? That was, uh, it was an epic battle every time, you know, usually <laughs> the food was gone before it was even finished. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, it really sucks for my dad when he come home from work and there's nothing there. I can imagine. I can imagine. And did you guys all play sports uh, in high school together or were you guys kind of spread out? So we're all about two years apart. So I was able to play with, um, you know, my older brother, Dan, my younger brother, Rob, um, and, and same with the other brothers as well. So we all were able to actually play with each other throughout high school. Incredible. And were you a fullback in high school or were you a linebacker? What position did you play? Yeah, more of um, like a linebacker, like running back, kind of fullback, but um, kind of did it all in high school. When you were in high school, did you know that you were going to grow up to be an entrepreneur? Did you have the entrepreneurial spirit at a young age? Um, I would probably say no. Um, didn't, didn't really have plans on it. I did watch my dad uh, you know, start his own business and 32 years later, he's still in business. And you know, I was back there, uh, you know, at his first store and you know, building treadmills, delivering them for him. So I did watch that, but I never really thought about it that way for myself, uh, kind of just stumbled upon it. And what kind of business did he run? Uh, fitness equipment. He's um, he sells fitness equipment, wholesale and retail. And um, it's the second largest distributor in the U.S. now. That's inc- oh, my God, that's incredible. Holy mackerel. And is, is he still 100% solely owned or is he partnered with anybody? Yeah, he started with his brother um, and then he bought his brother out about three years into it. So it's um, it's all him. Wow. Wow. That's unbelievable. So that was instilled to you. And did you let all you guys work at the um, uh, at the uh, facility or did you like what did, like did you did you work with him growing up? Yeah. So um, we all worked with him. And then my oldest brother, Gordy, who worked for him. Ended up hurting his back in college, and my dad's like, "All right, you guys aren't lifting treadmills anymore for me." So uh, <laughs> it kind of ended after me. So uh, the first three worked in the warehouse. We delivered treadmills. We did it all, and um, after after a couple injuries, it was over with. Yeah, yeah, but that I, I that instilled the the hard work and the work ethic in all of you, I would imagine. And um, <clears throat> you got a full um, football scholarship to University of Maryland, correct? Yeah, so uh, I ended up actually getting a late last minute offer. It's kind of kind of a crazy story, but uh, my brother Dan was there. He was doing well, and um, I was actually signed to go to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I probably would have paid a lot, but I was accepted into the Wharton Business School, which was wow. which was massive. Uh, the last minute, I got an offer because a lot of kids were failing out and, and they weren't getting some of the recruits in. So uh, I, I say it was because of grades. You know, they pretty much told me I better have a four when I get there. Uh, and I better help boost the, 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 the team's GPA because uh, they were really struggling. And so uh, that was kind of the goal when they brought me in was like, hey, we know this kid isn't going to be trouble. He's going to have good grades. And at that point, I don't even think they cared if I played, uh, you know, really started or not. So uh, <laughs> grades got me in. That's for sure. And and so did you did you end up graduating from uh, from Wharton? Uh, no, so I never went to Penn. I ended up taking the full scholarship to Maryland and then um, ended up transferring 
from Maryland to the University of Arizona. I played with my brother Rob there. I was actually playing with my brother Dan at Maryland. Transferred and um, you know, played with Rob and graduated from Arizona. That's fantastic. And then did you see the new studio that we built in the office? Drafted by the uh, Dallas Cowboys, or did you walk out? Uh, so I was undrafted free agent to the Dallas Cowboys. So you were an undrafted free agent with uh, with Dallas. So what was that like when you entered into training camp with them? Okay, go ahead and unmute me. Uh, so <laughs> it was kind of it was mayhem, man. Um, it was kind of this mentality that I you know I had one shot, one opportunity. And, um, you know, I had to do everything I could with it. So uh, I knew my back was against the wall and uh, it was almost a perfect mentality for the situation I was in. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if, uh, if I'm correct about this, you made the all rookie team in your, uh, in your first, in your rookie year in 2010, right? Yeah, I, I did get the all rookie team from uh, what was it? It's called pro football focus. So uh, they were new back then. It was, I think it was the first, second year, but they actually watched every single, um, you know, play that you're in and they grade the players. So uh, it was pretty cool to see them come out and, and grade me as uh, you know, rookie of the year for the fullbacks. Well, what's it like going through a full NFL football season? Uh, man, that's, <laughs> that's the biggest grind you'll ever go through. I'm sure. um, I see a lot of different, I guess, like fitness and health, um, you know, kind of uh, challenges these days. And you know, all that stuff that people are struggling through, that's kind of how it is, but on just an even bigger scale, yeah. uh, it, it is, it's a mental and a physical grind and you know, people don't realize it. It's not just a game anymore. It's, it's a job and, and it's an absolutely you know, brutal job, especially for a guy who's a bubble player, you know, a ton of stress at any time you can get cut. Um, you know, it, it's, it's physical and it's mental and it, it's an absolute drain. So, um, you know, you don't go out partying or anything like that. It's 100% football until that season ends. And that's why you see the guys have a good time at the parade right when it's over with. <laughs> yeah, I certainly saw your brother having a good time on that last one. I think Tom Brady did too, but. <laughs> I think Tom outpartied him for the first time ever. <laughs> I know, we saw that. They, uh, well, we'll leave that off uh, off camera, but uh, definitely, <laughs> that was interesting. But um, when you when you signed your first contract, right, um, did you did you seek advice or did you have mentors in your world that were giving you guidance on things to do and not to do with your money? Yeah, my, my parents were um, amazing role models for us. So going back to our jobs when we were younger, we had a paper route at the age of, I think I was 10 at the time. Uh, you know, we had that, we were umpiring, I was working for my dad. Uh, we really learned the value of a dollar super early on and we saved all our money. I think I had like had 30 to 40 K in my bank account going into college. So wow. um, that was just all money that, you know, it, it was, Hey, save this. Um, you know, we're not spending it on anything stupid. My mom was sewing all of our, uh, you know, sweatpants back together, our socks. I mean, it, it, we really do the value of a dollar and we do how to save money too. So um, parents definitely instilled that all into us. So uh man, I, I went through college with, with nothing, you know, we weren't allowed to work. My parents weren't giving us money. Yeah. Uh, the little money that we got, you know, went towards, uh, you know, rent and, and food. So uh, Rob would use 50 bucks uh, in college. We were college roommates. He had 50 bucks in his account. I'd play online poker to get extra money. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it was just a grind. So, you know, when we got these big checks, it wasn't like, you know, go spend it. We were always all about saving and, um, you know, just being, being, you know, using our resources i was still taking home food from the complex yeah. i know i think rob was in year three and he's still taking home food from uh you know new england's co you know, complex and i'm sitting at his house eating it so uh, yeah it's just uh it wasn't you know getting money to us at that time wasn't like some you know some amazing thing yeah we, we knew how to save it we knew how hard it was to come by as well and my parents did a great job instilling that in us you know, and I've been somebody who for years has always been of the opinion that college football players and college athletes in general ought to have the ability to market themselves and get paid. W real quick, what's your opinion about the new ruling that came out with the NCAA where now people, well, now athletes can use their name recognition to their advantage and actually get paid for it? I, I mean, I think it's great. Um, what I don't think people realize is that it's going to only benefit the top, you know, maybe 3% of guys. Uh, you know, so what it's, what's end up, what's going to end up happening is it's going to become a massive uh, recruiting tool that's going to be pretty unfair, um, I think, for the bigger schools or, or the schools with more money, because you're going to have all the, these these five star recruits walking in with, a, you know, appearance at the local high, uh, you know, the local car dealership for 50K already lined up. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's what it turns into. Um, 
you know, I, I think they're going to have to find a way to regulate it again. Um, and at the end of the day, I don't think majority of players are going to benefit from it. I think the very small, um, you know, majority top tier players at the top tier schools are going to get a lot of money and no one else is going to see anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, going back to your playing career for a moment, um, you know, because you certainly are somebody who has massively benefited and masterfully benefited from your name recognition and your entrepreneurial spirit, right? And I'll get to that in a few minutes. But <clears throat> as you're going through the NFL career, right? And I know that you moved, um, I believe, did you play for the, 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 the Chargers as well as the, um, as well as the Broncos? Yeah, so I got, I got my, my Cowboys here, yep. um, Colts as well. And then uh, I was with the Broncos for a year as well. And then I ended in camp with the Chargers, but uh, never actually played for them. I got hurt in camp. Got it. And so at that point, at that point, Chris, when did you start to recognize that you were going to have to maybe kind of diversify what you were doing in your career in, in business? Was it what was it while you were playing or was it when you got hurt? Like, when did you have that aha moment? Uh, before I ever made it, I just never thought there was going to be a chance. So, um, you know, for me, there was always, you know, a second plan. Um, that second plan originally was I had an accounting degree from the University of Arizona, and um, I saw a really good opportunity to do players' taxes. Uh, what people don't realize is that players have to file tax in every state we play in, and um, it's super expensive. So after paying, I think I paid like three grand my first year to, for a CPA to do it. I was like, wow, you know, I know how to do this myself. I started doing it myself the rest of the years, and I realized that none of the players knew how to do it. And I could have a you know a really cool business for like three months of the year, just helping out players. Um, ended up transitioning um, be, because my wife started a business my third year. She was sick of trying to find a job every every time I went to a new city. So uh, she started the business, and um, I just saw opportunity there and, and jumped on board after my first contract ran out. Chris, Eddie here. Um, you know what was it like? Because you you had mentioned you didn't expect to make it into the NFL. What was it like actually making it there? What's that feeling like? <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely a huge accomplishment. Um, you know, the, the big accomplishment was three years. That's when you get pension. That's when you get benefits, health benefits, uh, 401k, all that just really kicks in. So, uh, you know, after my first year, I was like, wow, this is, this is really happening. It was kind of like, you still couldn't believe it. So uh, at that point it was, I got to get three years. Uh, let's get three years. Let's get all the benefits. And then after that, it was just all bonus. So um, I ended up getting three years. I went in my fourth year. I got hurt. I actually took an injury settlement um, and I got credited a fourth season. So I got a fourth year of benefits as well. So uh, absolutely massive for me. I knew it wouldn't last long. Uh, my mentality at that point was just, you know, let's get three and let's go on to the next thing and use that money to to, to really see that whatever I want to do next. Yeah. And I, I hear a lot of entrepreneurial, right? Obviously it comes from your family and your upbringing, uh, getting that hustle inside of the NFL, helping people with their taxes. What was the transition like when you knew, okay, I'm, I'm done in the NFL now I'm moving on. What's that transition like? It's, it's rough for a lot of people. Um, you know, I had a lot of teammates, a lot of friends, you, you know, struggle with it big time because it's your identity. That's all you know. You've been doing it since you know high school or before that. And then all of a sudden it's gone. And then it's just an ego check too, because you're making, you know, by rookie year, I think I was making 35K a week. Uh, you know, you got paid per game. So to go from that to making, you know, maybe 60K a year is tough. And most guys don't want to do it. Um, you know, they also forget how much time and effort it took from high school on where they played for free to get to that point. But um yeah, I guess you kind of forget about that, but uh, it's tough. It's really tough. I got really lucky, though, because going back to my wife's business, she started it. Uh, it was doing well. I then my first contract ended. I had time to look into the business. I started working with her and I signed another contract uh, and went into Chargers camp. So you know, it really gave me a lot of time to kind of um, you know realize there's something great there and put time and effort into it. And then um, you know, I, I transitioned right into it and I went all in. So. I was probably working 80 to 100 hours with the business, so I completely took my mind off of football or, or any anything, other distractions, anything like that. I just went all in with the business. So for me, it wasn't a bad transition uh, because I had something that I fell into that was great. And, and I ended up, uh, after the first year, I was making more money with my wife than I was playing football. 
So wow. uh, it incredible. really didn't get any better than what, um, you know, that, than what happened for me. So and, and I, got, what, I definitely, got lucky. what kind of business does she run, Chris? What kind of business is it? So it was a personalization company. Um, you know, she got a, a hand painted wine glass from her aunt and she thought it was awesome. Uh, so she started hand painting wine glasses. I'd come home from practice. She'd put them in the oven and I was like, wow, like this is going nowhere. Uh, <laughs> 30 minutes to paint them. Uh, she was selling them maybe for like 20 bucks, something like that. She then had to bake them in the oven. She'd ship them out. They'd break. She'd have to replace them. And I'm like, what? But they sold and they kept selling. So she had to find a way to scale it. And she did. And then, you know, it just showed us that, that there was this massive opportunity there uh, in the personalizing in, in great business with holidays, weddings, um, different events like that, that we could really jump on. And, and we did. So started sourcing product and um, really digging into the higher margin products and, and buying the commercial grade laser engravers with the money I had from the NFL. And it just took off from there. And by the way, I'm looking over your right shoulder. Is that Darren Sproles that you're absolutely about to knock out in that picture yeah. right there? <laughs> yeah, except that I, I clotheslined him there. Um, I was coming off a block on a, a kickoff coverage, and actually, I have a scar from it because I, I tore my pec that game, and I'd have uh, I was out for the season. I had to have surgery after that. Oh my god! Holy cow! So was was that was that the last one? Was that the final injury, or what was? That? Oh, so that was that was my second year. I was with the Colts, and um, week seven, we were we were playing the Saints, and. I think we were down about 50, 54 to three. <laughs> it was a year that uh, Peyton Manning uh, got hurt. So uh, we started the season 0-13. And, and um, yeah, I got, I guess he looks like a small guy, you, you would think, compared to NFL players. But, you know, he's he's thick and, and he's fast. Yeah. And when he's running full speed and you try to clothesline him, uh, you get hurt, I guess. Bad things are going to happen. <laughs> Man, yeah, I know. I remember that Saints team was like the greatest show on turf 2.0. You know, it was some, they were, that was, that was, what an unbelievable time to play in the NFL, Chris. That, what an experience that must have been. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I went into a, a Cowboys team that was just stacked. And um, I called it the car show, man. You, you roll up, there's just $150,000 cars all over the place. Every day there was a new car on the lot. Man, it was, it was crazy, but it was definitely a fun time to play. Chris, with that in mind, that's I want to go back to something that you talked about before. Um, I find it so interesting that you you prepared taxes for your teammates, and I would imagine for other people that you had relationships with in the uh, in the pros. Are you finding that because for years it's been talked about about how profession, some professional athletes are not necessarily given good guidance when it comes to finances, when it comes to making investments, right? Um, you know that that's not something that they ever really focused on. And so they can be impressionable and there's a high trust factor, right? Are you finding now that that is shifting or do you think that that is still something that is out there that needs to be discussed at a higher level? No, it's still out there. Um, you, you don't know anything besides what you're doing. You know, you, all you know is football. You, you don't really know anything about the, the outside business world at all until you leave the game and you kind of step into it. So you know, guys don't know and people are sneaky. Uh, you know, they think you're there, you you know, you're their best friend and they can play it off and they know what they're after. So uh, the NFL PA does a great job of, of trying to sniff these out. Um, you know, they're going to send us emails multiple times a year saying, Hey, uh, this guy, this organization, stay away from them. Um, you know, they're, they're taking players money or whatever it is. So agents are going to look out for you as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it happens. You know, it happened multiple times where, you know, we were doing, uh, you know, charity events and, you know, the money was actually going uh, to people's pockets, you know, so we saw that or, you know, we show up and they say, hey, you, you have to, you know, and this happened to my brother, you have to sign 50 footballs. And he's like, I, I can't, I have a, a deal with New England card. I can't sign 50 footballs. Uh, well, you know, what do you mean? We paid you all this money. You have to do it. And that was a charity event where someone set it up, didn't tell them they were taking money and they were just stuff in their own pockets. So uh, definitely happens. Uh, the investment side's just as bad. You know, the guys are getting hit up nonstop because people know they're easy targets. They don't know uh, that outside world. They, they have no experience with it at all. So, yeah, so the level, so still to this day, even the level of importance for education on matters of finance and matters of making good decisions going forward is still incredibly high. And there's a great big need for that is what I'm hearing. 
Yeah, absolutely. And they try, I mean, we have meetings and the NFLPA can try as much as they want, but you know, when you're 21 years old and you got a bunch of money, you don't really listen that well. <laughs> I think both my partner and I yeah. can relate to that too, right, Ed? <laughs> Absolutely. So after the transition, right, from NFL, now you're helping your wife in this business and it's doing phenomenally well, you continue your entrepreneurial journey. What was the next step in that journey? Yeah, so for me, uh, I was about five years in with my wife and we were crushing it. I didn't have to do anything else. Um, you know, it really came down to more of what my passion was. You know, this business was great. Um, I didn't tell anyone what I was doing for five years. Uh, my teammates <laughs> would ask and I would just kind of say like, hey, I'm doing my own thing. Um, so it was kind of like that. Like I, I wasn't really you know, that excited about what I was doing, even though I was making a lot of money. So um, you know, I had this idea come by and um, you know, I was at the gym and I'm like, you know, this is what I like doing. I'm going to the gym twice a day still. I love sports. I love fitness. Uh, I love working out, you know, how can I get back into it? So um, when I thought of the idea for, you know, a, a better shaker bottle, that was kind of like that, that moment where I was like, man, this is my passion. I can go to the gym and call it work. Like I got to do this. So um, you know, that's how it happened. Uh, it was just an idea and I was super passionate about it. So I, I went for it, not because I needed the money, but more because, you know, I, I just love doing that. So I uh, started as a side hustle and um, you know, it, it, it started doing pretty well. And then I was able to get on shark tank and it just exploded from there. What was that like um, in comparison, right? So shark tank, we think of, you know, uh, sharks circling around and, you know, looking for, you know, this money, but are they taking advantage, not taking advantage? Are you getting the right deal going into that? I'm sure you did some preparation. What was that like compared to the preparation you would do say before a game? Yeah, it was, um, I mean, it's similar. You're, you're going out there, you're looking at your opponents, you're studying them. Uh, I watched every single episode that I could. I was lucky enough to have eight seasons before, um, you know, I went up there. So I had every question written down. I had every answer for every question and I was ready. So um, they got me with one question. That was it. And I was shocked by it, but I still think they were wrong about it. Um, but other than that, you know, if you know what's coming and you're prepared for it, you're going to go up there and you're going to be confident. And you're going to get offers. And we ended up getting offers from, from all five Sharks. Well, I got to tell you, too. Um, number one, you, 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 A-Rod can't hold a candle to you in a chugging contest, by the way, <laughs> in flip cups, right? That's number, <laughs> that's number one. Why Shark Tank, though, Chris? I find that so fascinating because, you know, I mean, you, you probably could have gone a, a, a number of different directions, right, with capital raise up for launching the business and for getting other private investors. So why did, why did you decide on Shark Tank? Just, just massive exposure, massive exposure, and um, really just that proof of concept too. You know, if, if all sh five sharks or even just one of them comes into the business, uh, it just shows the the whole world that you know it's a product worth investing in, and they should probably buy it too. So uh, those two things were massive, especially for me being six months in. Um, you know that you couldn't get a better uh, you know sign off when when two sharks come and invest into your company. So. Uh, that was massive. We, you know, we went from 80,000 in sales in the first six months to, to over 3 million in the next 12 months. And it was just, um, you know, company builder, you know, it really probably cut off a couple of years uh, of, of the building cycle for us. And, and also just the, you know, the revenue that came in from it were really you, helped take it to that next level. Were you super psyched that it was um, a rod and uh, Mark Cuban or, you know, were you itching for Mr. Wonderful or? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually shocked because Mr. Wonderful was the first offer, yeah, uh, yeah, which usually never happens. He usually waits till the end and then gives you some terrible offer right at the end. Uh, and they're so, so crazy as offers too. They're all over the place with equity and all kinds of stuff, right? You know. <laughs> oh yeah, he he tries. He really tries to really uh, you know get the most out of it. That's for sure. So uh, I was pumped when he was first, and then you know really wanted the wanted Mark and Alex just because they were sports guys. And they were in two different sports that I wasn't in. So um, really felt like we locked up the big three uh, sports in the U.S. when they when they jumped on board. And are all five of your brothers, it's five brothers, right? Five, or, or is it four brothers? No, it's five five total. So five, four brothers. Yep. Are all four of your brothers now equity partners in Ice Shaker? Or is is it just Rob? Or, or what, what's the structuring look like now? So it was originally just me. Um, Rob ended up retiring and buying out Alex um, when he retired. So. 
uh, he didn't really know what he wanted to do. So you know, he reached out and said, Hey, I want to get into the business world. Um, he saw a great opportunity. He loves the product. So uh, he ended up buying Alex out. So he is a part owner now. So it's Rob, um, Mark Cuban and I in the company right now. What's it like working with Mark? So Mark is, um, it, it's great because he's built out a team. He's been doing Shark Tank for, man, uh, 12 seasons now. And he's one of the originals. So uh, he has Mark Cuban Companies, which is, um, you know, a, a full company that just helps uh, all his Shark Tank companies. I think he has over 100 now. Uh, but the best things that come out of it is, you know, it's the advice, it's the networking, it's being able to reach out to any of his 100 other companies and say, hey, um, I need advice on this. You know, is SMS working? Is email working? Is Facebook ads working? Uh, you know, have you guys worked with th with this company before? And you, know, you get unbiased opinions from people that are in the same shoes as you and you can trust them. So that's been absolutely massive for us as well. And, you know, you're either working in your business or you're working on your business, right, Chris? And so what do you find, are, do, are, are you finding out that you're, that you're leveraging your time more effectively today than you were when you first launched it? How, what, what's the structure and what's the, the, the holistic um, uh, culture look like at iShaker now compared, in comparison to where it was when you first started? Yeah, when I first started, uh, I probably slept like three hours a night. Uh, <laughs> I was doing everything. I did everything for way too long and you know, despite my dad telling me over and over and over again that I have to delegate, I have to build a team, I just didn't listen. Um, you know, I really figured that out during COVID. Uh, I realized at that point I couldn't do everything. It was physically impossible. I couldn't even go to the warehouse. Uh, we had to have split shifts. So uh, at that point, I really dug deep. I reached out again to my dad. I reached out to other uh, successful business people in the community here in Dallas, and everyone kept saying the same thing. They're like, it's, it's not the product you have. The, the product compares everything else. It's the team, you know, look at these huge companies, look at these very successful companies. They have amazing teams and processes surrounding them. So, you know, that's what you have to build. Look at it like an NFL team. You know, you're the head coach, you know, and you have a bunch of assistant coaches and you have a bunch of players. You need to bring that same locker room feel into your business. And once I started doing that, it, it became a lot more fun and a lot more productive overnight. Incredible. And uh, before I transition over to you, Ed, um, I just want to put out there, everybody, the time is 728. And we're going to have a little bit of time for Q&A at the very, very end of the session at about 750. If you have a question for Chris, please either number one, put it in the chat or number two, please raise your hand and we will try to get you uh, get to you at the very, very end. Uh, but Ed, you had a question? But what I was going to say is, you know, through the uh, through the pandemic, you've made some changes in your business. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have, uh, have done the same, right? They transition, they adapt to, to what's going on in the world. And you've been fortunate enough to have that, you know, work well for you and expand. During this time, have you also looked at new ventures or the next hustle? Because it seems like you're the type of person that is constantly looking to move, change and innovate. Uh, I was doing that a lot early on, um, but really I was getting spread too thin. So uh, I've, I've locked down. We have a great path. We have you know, a, a great budget forecast. Everything's kind of in line now, uh, which which I didn't do right away. That was something I also struggled with and, and really had to implement. And, and now that we have it, we have this clear path. And, um, you know, I, I, the more things I try to bring on, uh, you know, the worse you end up doing, you really can't focus. So uh, instead of bringing on new ventures, it's really just expanding the product line. You know, we have jugs coming, uh, you know, we have coolers coming as well, and it's all geared more towards fitness and, and sports um, where you know, our competitors are more geared towards uh, either drinking or, uh, you know, hunting and fishing. So uh, we really want to be that, that sports brand. You know, we want you to bring our coolers to your, your kid's game, but also, you know, use that, that same bag for your prepared lunch um, and your meal prepping. So but that's kind of the space we fit into. And instead of bringing on new ventures, it's more of, you know, how do we expand into, into new things with, with iShaker. That's awesome. incredible. And, and Chris, it looks like we have a couple of questions. This pop just popped into the chat. One of them that I just saw was what's the website and where can people go for your inventory and take a look at iShaker? For sure. Yeah. So it's, it's iShaker.com. Uh, we sell on our website. You can customize there as well. You're going to get the best product selection there. Uh, we always do stuff to keep people on our website as well. So, uh, you know, there's, there's free items that get added to the cart as well, over a hundred bucks, stuff like that. So, uh, definitely recommend the website. 
Uh, if you're just a huge Amazon lover, obviously we're there. We're at Vitamin Shop, we're at GNC, uh, we're at Lifetime Fitness as well. We're in grocery stores. Um, and we just got our first PO from Walmart coming for spring too. So, so that was a, a pretty big deal getting that last Friday. Came in. Amazing. And uh, really was a big, big end to, uh, to our biggest month so far. So it's been pretty cool. That's incredible. That's incredible. And, you know, from, I want to build off of Eddie's question for a second, Chris, because <clears throat> when we talk about, we talk about innovation, I think that the, the pandemic caused innovation in many, many entrepreneurs, right? And many businesses. I know for us, <clears throat> Epic Financial Strategies is a one-stop shop financial wellness center, but where most people in, you know, call it the financial services arena, relied so heavily on the face-to-face -face interaction when that got t taken away, certain businesses just went, you know, went to their pasture. They went to death. Ours escalated to the point where we went up to almost a thousand sales meetings per, per month. And the reason for that was because of innovation and relationships with other ecosystems. And, and, and what I want to shift the focus towards is in your innovation, I noticed that you have a massive following on social media between your podcast between Instagram, I think you have about 95,000 followers on Instagram. Uh, you have Gronked Up, right? The podcast. What are you doing to innovate in the social media space to continue to build out your brand? Yeah, I do a lot with social. In, in TikTok is actually my biggest platform, which um, mm. surprises a lot of people, but uh, massive reach. Uh, it, it was actually, I got challenged on my podcast to try to build my TikTok profile. And um, Wow. Within 30 days, I was able to grow it from, I had about 10,000 followers to over 350,000. And, um, wow. and within 30 days, I reached over 50 million people um, with my video views. Wow. So um, yeah, that, that really came about just because of the pandemic as well. I, I realized that you know online was going to be a huge focus. People weren't leaving their houses. How can I reach them? And how can I reach them efficiently? Um, you know, the cheapest way possible, which was for free with social media and do so in a way that made the, uh, an impression on them. So uh, I sat back and said, how can I drive value to these people? How can I provide them with something that they're going to either use or they're going to share or they're going to be entertained by? And um, you know, that was the whole strategy behind it. So I, I started cranking out videos about you know, behind the scenes stuff with the NFL, behind the scenes of um, Shark Tank. And I just tried to provide information that people could actually use. Um, and, and with that, and by doing that, it created value and, and and trust you know they started trusting me and then just naturally uh would buy the product as well just just because they felt like uh you know i helped them out and they wanted to help me out as well so we have a question here from uh trevon gross and trevon asks uh you know what did you learn in football that you have applied to your business and life a lot a lot so um Definitely not the day-to-day -day skills. Uh, that's the one thing about leaving the NFL. I mean, the things that you work on each and every day, you know, like how to, how to actually block someone, you know, those daily skills, those are, they're all useless after, after you're done playing. What you learn is, you know, you learn hard work. Um, you learn how to put a schedule together. I still think being a student athlete uh, is incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. uh, when I left college, I was like, wow, you know, that, that's insane. I mean, you're a full-time student plus a full-time athlete and you have a full schedule and then you're still trying to party and have fun at the same time. Uh, so if you can get through all that, still have good grades and, and, and still be successful in football, that's a huge accomplishment. And you just naturally learn how to manage your schedule uh, in a very efficient way. Uh, teamwork, teamwork's absolutely huge. Uh, going back to kind of that whole thing where, um, you know, I, I took way too long to implement a team. Uh, when I finally did, it finally clicked. And, I, and that was the one thing that you see, but you don't necessarily uh, apply right away. So I'm glad I finally did. But yeah, when it comes down to it, it's similar. Um, you're waking up early, you're grinding, you're putting that work in. Um, you know, hopefully you built an awesome team and, and you have the same goals and, and you're working towards the same thing every day. So um, it, it, once you get there, it, it definitely feels like a locker room and it's very similar. What, what's your focus on growing up? What do you, what do you, what do you focus in on, uh, Chris? Is it just, is it broad-based topic? Is it focused? Like, what do you, what, where, and where do you see the podcast going from there? Yeah. So we, we started the podcast during the pandemic because, um, actually it was actually before the pandemic, but, um, it, it did well during it. And, and the focus was really just providing an area of expertise. So, um, it started because I was getting so many questions about, 
you know, what do I do uh, to get in shape? You know, what kind of workouts do you, what do you eat? Uh, you know, what kind of workouts should I do for the NFL? How do I get to that next level? Uh, and then it, it started transitioning into business as well. You know, how do you start an email list? Uh, how do you do Facebook ads? All kinds of questions that, you know, I was just writing one word or, or one sentence lines back on social media and I was just doing it all day, every day. And it really wasn't providing any value to anyone. You know, one line or, or even a small paragraph wasn't helping anyone. So I wanted to dig deep on these topics. And then when people reached out, I would just say, hey, you know, I, I did a full 35, 45 minute podcast about this exact topic. I think it's going to help you out a lot. You know, just go listen to this episode instead. Uh, and, I, and I think that really helped people out a lot. We had people that would come back uh, six months later, sending me before and after pictures, uh, just looking absolutely shredded. And I'm like, man, that's amazing to see. So uh, that was really the focus. And then after I ran out of topics that I was an expert in, I started bringing in experts uh, in their topics. So, um, you know, anyone that I could find that I thought would help out our audience um, at first when the pandemic hit, it was nutrition coaches. Um, it, it was uh, uh, mind coaches, like mind and body coaches. Um, you know, anyone that could really help someone through a tough time, I was bringing in at first. And also, you know, the nutrition side was big too, because everyone was kind of just sitting at home and not going to the gym. Uh, <laughs> Then from there, just really expanded into man, all kinds of people. One of the last ones uh, we did was um, we had Steve Madden on. And he told the Wolf of Wall Street story. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. About going public and like the whole the whole thing. And I was like, man, this is the coolest story ever. <laughs> yeah. So that at that point um, with the podcast, we're like, this this is incredible. I wanted to bring it to video format. So I started looking at studios. And then we just, with the business, it, it just took off. So um, we are kind of still in a transition with it, but I haven't done a podcast in a while. Well, I got to tell you, you're hired, Chris, because I have this <laughs> thing going on called a dad bot that I would like to get. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can identify. With, well, you can't identify with that. You still got the guns from the Shark Tank. I mean, you, <laughs> that was like your first pose, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I came out. That was part of the pitch. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Now, <laughs> You have uh, you have three boys, right, Chris? Yep, I have a, a four year old, a three year old, and a one year old. Which one of them is going to be uh, playing in the NFL? Man, uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> they're, they're looking pretty good so far. My my uh, my wife is a lefty, so they're playing baseball now, and I'm like, yeah, I like I like this lefty swing over here. So yeah. they're, they're starting to get pretty good. Uh, we got a short porch in Yankee, uh, short porch in Yankee Stadium, so we could use them there. Got I it. like it. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, um, before we get to some of the questions, because the chat is absolutely blowing up, and I know a lot of people have questions for you, and um, yeah, I, I again want to thank you so much for spending the time on the Infinity X stage. I think what you've done is absolutely inspiring. Um, I would love to 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 hear more about if you plan on building um, education for NFL players. Like as you had mentioned, are you still doing any type of uh, you know, taxation or, 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 or tax prep or anybody, anything like that for any of the guys that you, you played with or that you have relationships with? No, so I, I don't do it anymore. Um, I try to help out whenever I can though. I, I do get asked a lot by the NFL PA to come speak, yeah. uh, help out players and, and do events like that. So um, I have spoke at a couple of them and um, I, I think I'm, one of the few few guys that that leave and, and have a really cool story to tell. So uh, I like going back and they're trying to get guys to think about it a little bit more while they're playing, because that's really the opportunity you have to really build your audience and really think about that next step. So uh, it's so hard to do because you are just, you know, you're focused on being the best player you can, but there is an off season and there's an off season when you know, you're not doing that much. And there, there is time to take advantage of some of the programs. So when I was playing, I did, um, you know, take advantage of the programs. I went back to the entrepreneurship program at Harvard and, um, you know, I was able to take a, a week long course there. Uh, it was actually with, you know, their best professors. And I know that because uh, the students that came in to also help teach us would complain that we got the best teachers and they've been trying to get in those classes for <laughs> years. So, uh, you know, huge opportunities that you can take advantage of in the off season. And I try to get the players to think like that because it doesn't matter how good you are. It's going to end at some point. Uh, it could end tomorrow. You know, you, you never know. It's just one injury away from your, your, your career being completely over with. So guys have to be ready for that next step. I'll tell you one thing that's not going to end is your innovation, right? You know, because 
if you, where you're standing right now is even remotely close to what you're going to innovate in the future, I would be absolutely shocked, Chris. So what does the future look like for Chris Gonkowski, right? What is the future? What, what are you looking to expand out on? I, you know, like, where do you, where do you see Where do you see this growing over the next call five years? Yeah. I mean, I tell people all the time, I think it took me four years to really learn how to run a business correctly. Um, now I, I'm kind of that guy that everyone comes to and says, Hey, uh, how'd you do this? How'd you do that? Um, it, and I feel like I can go into any situation now and really help people out. So, uh, I do do it every once in a while, but once you figure it out and once you, you kind of build that culture and team, the, the sky's the limit at that point, it's just, you know, you continue to put the pieces in place. You go attack the, the thing that you think is going to be the most successful for you. You figure it out, you put that process in place, and then you put that team member there. And that's all I'm doing right now is attacking what I think is the, the best areas for growth for us. So uh, I think the, the future is going to be pretty big. Um, we're, we're definitely doing well. We're, we're hitting and, and beating our forecasts. And uh, I think the sky's the limit right now. So I'm excited to see where we end up in, in about five years. That's fantastic. And, you know, they say culture in business is that is is everything, you know. So what do you if you could give advice to the entrepreneurs that are on here, the business owners in terms of the culture that you continuously look to build inside of uh, of your company, what advice would you give to them? Yeah. So uh, this was my advice for my dad. Uh, Thirty two years in it, he, he had kind of that same structure to, um, you know, keep people incentivized and also keep them as a team. But he incentivized everyone as a team. All his team leaders were incentivized as a team. Um, I, I thought it was the most genius thing ever because everyone holds each other accountable. But a great example is, um, you know, you're going to have a sales team. They're going to try cramming orders in the last minute. You know, they're going to do whatever they can to get an order in, right? They're going to pr promise, you know, one day shipping or get it out the next day. And all that would do was, um, you know, cause conflict with, with the guys in the warehouse that were trying to customize the bottles and get them out. So um, my, my dad simply said, hey, I put this structure in 32 years ago where everyone's incentivized as a team. So it, it's not your sales guy getting a bonus for, uh, you know, cramming all these last minute terrible orders in. You know, it's not your team a, a, as an overall profit and goal that, that's getting, um, you know, getting that bonus. So once we did that, everything changed. Everyone started cheering each other on. It became that locker room feel. And, and that was absolutely massive. And then for me, the, you know, the thing I don't like doing is I don't like sitting there disciplining people. Uh, so it almost became this self-monitoring thing where, you know, if someone wasn't doing well, everyone else's bonus depended on it as well. And it kind of just flushes you out or, or really you know, gets everyone kind of on you so that you do start doing the work. So I, I thought it was one of the greatest things ever. Um, it took a lot of pressure off my shoulders and it really aligned everyone together. And so I, I highly suggest that it was hard to kind of figure it out, but there's ways to do it. And if you can figure that out, that it, it, it's massive. It's definitely a huge step. And anytime you can incentivize people uh, in any way, they're, they're definitely going to feel like they're more a part of it. And you know, they're going to work as a team together as well. It's, it's, it's going to take you to that next level. Incredible. Incredible. It, we are infinityx.com. Eddie Gartner, Dave Harder. We are here with the mighty Chris Gronkowski, all things mega entrepreneurial. And um, Ed, why don't we go to the uh, to the chat here? And, yeah, uh, answer I, some, I actually wanted to bring up a uh, a world class entrepreneur. Uh, Wayne Rice has his hand raised. Ooh, all right, all right. Wayne, go ahead. Let's go ahead and unmute Wayne Rice. There he is. There hey, guys. Hey, Chris. How are you doing, man? Doing well. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Got you, Wayne. So, Chris, I had a two-part for you. Um, one is, what's the greatest challenge that you had to overcome working with your wife? <laughs> is what, if you haven't done something already, what will you do to teach your kids what you know as far as entrepreneurial-wise and financial-wise as they grow older? I like it. I like it. All right, greatest challenge with the wife. Uh, I think it was kind of just splitting responsibilities because, uh, you know, anytime we got on top of each other, we tried to do the same thing in the business. It, it obviously became a huge issue and a big problem and, and turned into fights. So, uh, you know, we had to find a way to kind of set our own roles and, and really give each other responsibilities. So uh, that was that was by far the hardest part. And, and then once we did, it was fine. You know, it, it was no big deal. People ask all the time, how do you do it? You know, we're, we're not, we're not stepping on each other's toes. We're doing our own thing all day long. And then we're kind of meeting up at the end of the day 
just like any of our other team members and saying, hey, how can we get better here? Uh, and kind of going over notes. So it ended up being being great. Uh, it's definitely been great. And uh, we complement each other well. So that's been good. Uh, part two, what will I teach my kids? Uh, this has been hard for me because when you have money and when you can give your kids whatever you want to, you know, it's hard to say no. And I think one of the things that parents have to do is say no. You know, my mom was a great example of it. Every time we walk by the candy aisle, you know, all five of us try to grab candy and not once <laughs> um, ever let us get candy. It's just how it was. We used to do, um, you know, the Burger King chant when we drive by Burger King, we all chant Burger King, Burger King. And all of our friends and, and, and their parents would be sitting in the Burger King line after, uh, you know, after practice. And my mom would drive by every single time. Like there was no giving in no matter what. But there was no handouts, everything you had to earn. And it sounds like, you know, it sounds easy to do. But it's, once you have kids, you're like, wow, this is actually really hard to do, especially when you have the money to do it. So uh, that's the one thing that I want to make sure I do is I make sure that they earn everything they have. And my, even when we got scholarships, it wasn't, you know, here's a free car. It was, hey, you want a car? Cool. <laughs> go, go get a job and go buy one. You know, if you want to go to college, awesome. You know, my dad said he would he would help us pay for it, but we would have to pay him back. So that's how it always was, was, you know, you earn everything that you have. And I want to really make sure I do a good job of that with my kids. Other questions, Ed, in the chat? Thank you, Wayne, for that. Wayne, you're the man. There's, there are some uh, comments in here uh, talking about your support for the military, and that's that's a beautiful thing. Um, you, you talked about how you keep your team motivated. Um, somebody, uh, Nikhil is asking, um, he says he's a huge morning person. Uh, do you have a specific routine for your morning? Yeah, yeah it kind of changed when COVID hit. Uh, but <laughs> I, was, I was definitely big. And it still is because, you know, with three kids, um, you have to find times where you can really focus. Uh, so for me, that's it's either when they go to bed or it's before they wake up. So um, I do wake up early. I was up today at 430. Um, at this point, I, I like to get a good hour at least of just like, you know, really locking in, focusing for me this morning, it was the end of the month financials, which, you know, if I'm not locked in for those, uh, it's, it's definitely a, a rough day. So I'll wake up, I'll really focus and crush out what's, what's the most important things that really uh, need a lot of attention. And then I'll actually go to the gym, um, usually around six o'clock and I'm kind of, you know, finished that hour and a half of, of tough work, got to get, you know, kind of reset and kind of balance myself back out, get that stress out, uh, get that workout in. And then I'm back home, get the kids ready for school and, and I get them off to school and then it's back on, on to work. So uh, that's the schedule that works for me. Uh, and then, you know, during the day, it's just kind of, you know, it, it's a lot of back and forth with all kinds of things popping up. So I, I want to make sure that those really important things were done in the morning. Start your day when it's dark. Right. You know, that's that's the advice that a, uh, a very successful entrepreneur client of ours uh, gave me about two years ago. And I totally identify with that, Chris. And, um, you know, with that success leaves clues. Right. You're a massively successful guy. You've had you, you know, you had terrific role models in your parents. Um, obviously, your brothers have experienced a massive amount of success as well. Um, but who are some people that you match and mirror and model after in the business world? Um, who are some people that you would consider to be mentors for yours? Yeah, for sure. Um, when I first started the business, I would listen a lot to the MFCO project uh, podcast from Andy Frisella. So, um, you know, he was out there 300 episodes in just talking about everything you possibly think of with, with business, you know, um, down to even, you know, email lists. Yeah, I started my email list the day after I listened to his podcast about emails. Uh, so, it, you know, really broke it down to, you know, the simplest levels and, and it was just all free. So definitely looked up to him. You know, I had a lot of 4 a.m. mornings where you know, I was at the warehouse with, with headphones in, just, you know, not in my head, like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get through this. Like, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're doing this. Uh, so uh, definitely, definitely looked up to him. Uh, was lucky enough to then have him on my podcast, which was an absolute honor. But um, you know, definitely him, my dad, for sure. Um, I, I don't think I use my dad enough as a resource. It's kind of one of those things where like, you know, you think you could do it on your own and you don't need to listen to pops. And then, you know, four years into it, you're begging for his advice. <laughs> so uh, now, now I'm on the phone with him whenever I can. And I'm like, Hey dad, how, how did you figure this out? You know, he has over 200 employees now. And wow. like, you know, how, 
how did you do it? Like, what, what got you to this point? And it's, you know, it's just, you slowly learn over time and, you know, you pick up things. And, you know, at one point he did have a company come in, a consulting firm come in and kind of restructured his business for him. So you know, he's given me all those tips over 32 years for free, mm -hmm. uh, which is absolutely massive. So uh, I, I now, I now do listen to him and okay. call him all the time for advice. That's fantastic, Chris. And, um, you know, I think for me, the, uh, the you know, the last, the, the, the last question that I would have for you before we go back over to the chat is when you leave this mortal coil, as my partner Rob Gill would always say, right, what type of legacy do you want to leave, not only for your kids, but also for people in general? What do, what do you want to be remembered most? Or, you know, what do you want to be remembered for as, as Chris Kronkowski? Yeah, uh, for sure. Just first off, you know, just hardworking. You know, I think that's always been a staple of mine. You know, I'm always going to show up, going to be consistent, um, always going to get the work done. You know, you can count on me at the end of the day. And I think really that's that's what makes most people successful. You know, you don't have to be, uh, you know, the most talented person in the world. You got to just consistently show up and, and get the job done. Uh, so, I, you know, that's that's definitely something I, I pride myself in. Um, you know, there's never an order that I promise to get out that I don't get out. You know, I pulled a lot of all-nighters, a lot of all-nighters just to get stuff out that I promised that I would get out. So uh, I definitely, I definitely hope that's, that's one thing that I'm remembered for. And the second would just be the kids. Um, you know, I want to instill values in them that, uh, you know, that my parents did with me. So I, I want to live through them and, and make sure that, you know, they're, they're hard workers as well. And, um, you know, they respect everything that they have and have that same you know, attitude that I have. Incredible. Incredible. Ed, anything in the questions in chat? I'm looking through. If you have any other questions, please type them in. Um, looks like we've gotten through a lot of them. A lot of comments. Um, uh, some people talking about how they have your shaker. Um, they, they love, they love the shaker. Uh, I love the idea and the concept of bringing out, uh, different product lines inside of what you're already doing. Um, going more, deep than than casting a wide net right staying right in in your space and finding new verticals in there so that's uh that's tremendous chris last question again uh, i know final final here is what do you see going forward um being some of the big struggles and or challenges not only for your business but also for businesses in general as you know we operate in very very uncharted waters you know with all the money that's been flowed into the economy, right? That's going to have to get paid back at some point, right? And, and you know, if, if, if tax, tax rates changes, et cetera, um, that obviously could be a crunch on businesses. But what do you think or what do you see being stumbling blocks that, that, that businesses need to get themselves prepared for? Yeah, I already see it. I, I see it a lot with, with supply chain mm. um, and just also forecasting as well. It's pretty much impossible right now. Um, and then supply chains, you know, it's, there's so many industries just getting absolutely crushed by it. Um, it, and on top of that, was, you know, increasing shipping prices, uh, freight prices, containers are just through the roof. Um, you know, a container right now is, you know, that I was paying in January 4,000 for is now $23,000, uh, you know, to get here. So, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of challenges uh, I, and there's just so much uncertainty that it's hard to plan for it, which makes it even harder. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, from a, from a, a preparation perspective, I mean, obviously you don't want to give away, you know, any type of golden nuggets, but what are some of the things that you've put in place in order to be able to defend against that? Uh, just ordering way in advance has been, um, you know, big for us. So really forecasted super early and, and, and then ordered really early to try to protect ourselves. Uh, you know, that's, that's really all you can do at this point. Um, and then, you know, kind of got prepared again for, uh, you know, a, a second wave, you know, if the second wave comes and, and we get put back into that situation, you know, what do we need to do again to, to be successful? So uh, that's, that's kind of what we've been preparing for. And luckily for us, uh, you know, online sales do well and we're really good online. So um, it, it didn't crush us last time because we were strong in that aspect. So um, really it, it would come down to supply chain, which I'm hoping that we also uh, took care of as well. Wow. Oh. I, Chris, I, I am, I think I could speak for my partner and all of us over here at Epic when I say that uh, if there's anybody that's going to be able to conquer it, it's you, you know, and um, I think I just want to congratulate you 
on just a massive career and you're up to incredible, incredible things. I see you in our future, you know, and um, you're certainly somebody that, uh, that I'd love to continue to have proximity, uh, proximity towards. And Eddie, uh, before we uh, finish up, any final finals, brother? I just wanted to, uh, yeah, thank you for, for coming on, sharing your story. Uh, we love hearing from entrepreneurs, especially those that learned it from a previous generation. Gr growing up, uh, watching my father blue collar work and, and build a business no different than your father. Uh, it's always a an inspiring story and to hear what you're talking about and, and your concerns about passing that on to the next generation. I know Dave and myself and probably a lot of the listeners here would uh, you know, express those same concerns, right? As you start to do better, you want to do better for your children, but how do you also inspire them to do better for themselves? So, you know, folks, in closing, we are Infinity X. We continue to bring value each and every single week. We give a stage and a microphone to the absolute excellence of excellence. And Chris, I cannot thank you enough for walking us through your journey. Um, you know, sharing and being vulnerable with us about what it was like growing up with those bees. And by the way, last question for you is uh, who would win in a game of flip cup, right? I really want to know that, you know, like, and do you guys play that in Thanksgiving? Yeah. So, um, you know, during, you know, the week of Shark Tank, I practiced a lot. That's for <laughs> sure. I probably practiced flip cup just as much as, as the pitch itself. So um, <laughs> I'm probably, I'll probably still win just because I practiced for so long. I got it down now. So. I'll, I'll definitely bet on myself right now. No question. Well, I would bet on you too, brother. You're a winner. And I, I just want to congratulate you for everything that you're up to in the world, where you're going. We continue to expect to see just amazing, massive things out of you. And uh, Chris, it's just been an absolute honor and a privilege to have you on the Infinity X stage, brother. And, um, you know, yeah, any, any parting words for the audience before we conclude? Oh, man. No, I just I really appreciate having me on. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited for the future. So that's, that's a good thing. When you're excited about what you do, I, I think that's what's, you know, the most important thing. You know, if you have passion for it, you're going to be great at it no matter what. So you'll find that passion. It'll you know, start as a side hustle if you need to. But that's what I did. Um, you know, super successful in what I was already doing. I just said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm more passionate about something else. So if that is you, uh, and you're sitting there and you're like, wow, I really would love to do this instead, then, then go for it. Like, but just start it as a side hustle. You don't have to dive all in and, and go crazy with it. Just, you know, start it and see if there's something there and then see if it grows, see if it gets bigger, see if you truly love it and then take that next step. Once it gets to that level, that's, that's my advice for anyone that, you know, ask how to be an entrepreneur or where to start, you know, just start small and, and see if it makes sense. And then, you know, if it does and you love it enough, then take that step. Incredible. Incredible. What a story. What a, what a value proposition, Chris. And, um, you know, for all of us at Epic Financial Strategies and Infinity X, Chris, we just want to thank you. It was an honor and a privilege to share this stage with you, brother. And uh, folks, this is going to be the conclusion of our session tonight. We want to thank you again on behalf of my partner, Eddie Gartner, Rob Gill, who could not be here. We are Infinity X. We are infinityx.com. Until next week, we will see you next Tuesday. Chris, you're the man. Really appreciate everything tonight, brother. And uh, please, you know, with, uh, with everything that's going on out there, please stay safe as well, my friend. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Thank you. Everybody have an amazing night. And until next week, we are Infinity X. We will see you next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Everybody have an amazing night.